Hello Internet. Yeah, I'm supposed to say I'm excited, but you know, I am excited. I'm not going to lie about it. We're really honored today. We've got Colonel Franz for here. You know him very well. Free to uh, Battalion Ricky Group has sent a few mates and they're talking about snatch operations. Now, as I understand it, is sometimes these people, South African soldiers, would go into enemy territory and they would try and kidnap or grab or snatch a guy, bringing back for intelligence purposes. Now, as you can imagine, this is not as easy as it sounds. I mean, you actually have to cross the river, you have to go into enemy territory, you have to get that guy, and he's not going to come by himself. So, without further ado, let us uh, see what Colonel France is telling us with mates. Thank you to all of you for watching here. We are really grateful to you. Good afternoon, Kuis. Kuis, we've been asked to tell you the story about 3-2 Battalion Recce Group Snatch Operations. Now, Snatch Operations means that you go over to the adversary or the enemy side and you literally catch a person um, for certain reasons um, and it's, it's, it's mostly to get information about the enemy or the adversaries and um, that is what the snatch operation is all about. So it was in 1980. The, the war was escalating and uh, Chief of Staff Intelligence in the Runu area, they were um, lacking certain information on uh, true build-up on the other side of the river and um, they decided that they wanted to interrogate soldiers that's on the other side, preferably higher profile guys with a rank or whatever, but it's difficult to distinguish at night if, uh, because they don't wear ranks and so on. So um, it was decided that there will be two snatch operations, one at Kalai and one at Diriku, which is on the um, Angolan, southern Angolan side. So uh, two teams was identified with myself and Zach Garrett with his team of five guys to go and do a snatch. And um, my target was on um, Diriku, no, Kalai. Um, Zach would go to, to Derico. Now, my plan was to execute the snatch operation in the area where the soldiers normally after hours drink and social and, and so on. So, we all know what it's like. You drink and, 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 and socialize and then you have to relieve yourself in one or other way. And that is where we planned the operation to be. So if somebody went out to relieve himself, normally they are a little bit intoxicated and they off their guard if you are doing whatever you are doing. So that was our plan. So um, Zach will explain his story. I had a five-man team. Uh, it consisted of myself, um, Pete van Eden, Fitzgerald, Riklop and Tabu Maria. Now Tabu Maria and Pete, they are big, strong, physically brilliant operators. They carved the Nobkiri to knock out the guy and everything. They were highly trained and ready for this operation. So our plan was to, to um, some people would take us across the river, drop us off, we would infiltrate and um, I planned the snatch to take place at about 10 o'clock after they had enough liquor and built up a good um, bladder to empty or whatever. <laughs> um, it was first phase moon so we would infiltrate during the moon and then it would go dark moon if we snatched and exfiltrate so that if they are following us we could um, use the, 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 the cover of, of night to do that. So we were taken over the river at, at last light um, and we were offloaded and then the, the route we would have taken would have been about 12 kilometers or so. But when you cross the river there's a swampy area 
and then it's a, a, a clear grass plain area, then there's a, a, a road stretching or running east-west, and then there's a high bank, and that was our infiltration route. So we would enter the town from the north. And on our way, as we infiltrated, we passed this open grassland and it was, the moon was up, so we were very visible. And as we were walking, we heard the, the, the rattling of PKM rounds slapping on the magazine of a PKM. And Pete and Tabu, the, the big guys, they, in our sticks, they carried these weapons. And they immediately said, guys, there's a patrol coming, they're carrying a PKM. And this was coming down the road. So, there was one little bush about five meters from the road. But this bush was too small to give cover to five guys. So... <laughs> We had made a hasty plan, we all dashed for this little bush and we all tried to hide behind this bush and um, we decided amongst one another there and then we're going to snatch the guys, yeah. So, the, uh, uh, but this needed to be done quickly. So we decided we will wait until half of the patrol is over. Now, we don't know how big or how long the patrol is or whatever, we'll wait until two or three guys pass us then I will get up and I will fire into their backs. The other two guys will get up and they'll fire towards the other people still coming. And Pete and uh, Tabu would go into the middle and grab the guy and snatch him. And so said and so done. So I am going to kindly now hand over to Fitz and to read just to give their input and then I'm going to hand over to, to Pete that actually executed the snatch. Um, the operation that was given to us by CSI to obviously snatch a person for intelligence. They did explain um, the ranking system which I believe, if I remember correctly, was affected through the colour of the MRI. But Quite frankly, um, first person that you get your hands on, that's the person you're going to take. So it didn't particularly make much of a difference to us as long as we got the person, a person, got them across the river to CSI for CSI to then interrogate for the information they needed. So as Francois says, the plan was in fact to go into Kalai town initially, um, try and snatch these guys at the local tavern. Uh, and then bring it across the river, but uh, our plans are rudely interrupted by this patrol. Um, and while the operation is meant to be swift and silent, you nonetheless prepare for the worst possible outcome. The worst possible outcome would be a confrontation with an armed patrol, or you've been discovered and compromised. So we were dressed for um, a short patrol, but heavily armed. And um, thankfully we were, because that is exactly what happened. Now sooner had we commit an infiltration than a unexpected patrol. We had been assured that nothing really happened on a Saturday night. There was going to be nothing on the car, but you know, best laid plans often don't go the way you want them. So this patrol materialized out of absolutely nowhere. So I'm not going to explain um, the snatch itself, I'll leave that up to Pete because he actually executed it. Yeah, um, it's Rick, Rick Robbie, yeah? um, I was with uh, these guys on that snatch. I can remember very little about it, um, um, except for the fact that we were there. Thank God we had strong guys like Tabu and Pete. They grabbed him. They yes, grabbed him. It was an interesting operation. Yeah. And I don't think there's too many of them that get done by SADF troops. I was fortunate to be on the team and have the privilege of experiencing that type of operation. Yeah, I can speak my ear then. That it also bears what Frans and Fritz said, yeah. I can tell you that 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 I can t
want ik kan daar wel zeker niet klein stellen in mijn rij. Ik was bijna kleiner dan onze. Ik met onze hart op zeker makkelijke 60, 70 meter voordat ze nog kon plat trekken. En die race is de schijnendste. Dus dat probeer ik niet ons. Hoe viel om plat getrek? Ja, ons het opgesprongen om te grijp. En ons, ons was aanvankelijk het ons besluit ons al om geslaan het. Ik en daar was om gekregen het. Ik het met het knuppel geloop wat ons gemaakt het en ik zo'n mooie kop geslaan het. En uh, ons het ook uh, een middel gehad wat de dokter voor ons gemaakt het wat ons om zo inspijt. Maar uh, die knuppel is weg met die hardloop en ons het samen met hom hardloop en om aan die grond afgedrukt en op was gedrukt tot Frans hulle die ons geskiet het en tot ons om opgetel en tot ons daar vanaf weg te gaan. Was hier een goede rugby speler op school? Ja, nee, ik heb dan een rugby gespeeld op school. Tavo was nog meer een groot rugby speler en Tavo was een beetje groter dan ik, maar ons op Palskarm cursus was ons ook twee baris geweest, ons het samen elkaar rondgedraas. So. Ik zal nou niet die, die opzomming en die nee. exfiltratie in het zorg als, als het terecht is meer. Koos, so, um, Pieters just told you that, that they grabbed this guy and he actually ran with him a distance. Now, I can testify that Pete and Tabo is great rugby players and their weight advantage, it shows you the strength a person can actually, I believe, with adrenaline, imagine you're walking in a patrol and all of a sudden somebody from the side starts shooting on you and, and somebody wants to catch you. I mean, I, I, if you put yourself in the shoes of this guy, I'm sure he grabbed his pants. But sorry for that, but it, it just, you know, brings out the, the, the strength of this guy. But um, Pete and Tabu got this guy under control. Between myself, Fitz and Rick, we thought we killed about 30 people, but uh, reports thereafter reported that we didn't even shoot one. But we shot a lot of shots. We fired a lot of shots. But as it might be, when, when Tabu and Pete got this guy under control, we handcuffed him and then we bound a, a, a piece of, of cloth material through his mouth so because he wanted to shout so that he could not make a, a noise. Now, time-wise, the guys that brought us over the river, we said we'll be back hopefully by 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock the next morning to exfiltrate. At that stage, it was about 10 o'clock. We were finished, we, we caught our person and we exfiltrated. And uh, I had to call them up on the radio and, um, uh, you know, they, they came back because they went somewhere um, because it's a few hours they have to, to wait somewhere. Um, but the, the, our way out, um, we went through a very thick marshy area. So it was difficult because between Pete and Tabu, they had to control this guy because he wanted to run at all times. So they had their hands full of, you know, controlling this guy and making sure that he doesn't escape. And uh, Rick and Fitzy was covering our backs because a lot of shots was now fired, so a lot of people were alerted. And, you know, we expected that, that somebody could come um, after us. But um, the guys that had to pick us up, we, we talked them into our position. And um, we were took, uh, taken over the river again, back to the other side. And I think we were back in base delivered the, 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 the guy we caught, we grabbed um, to CSI, there was a Lieutenant Dave Jenkinson, um, who was the, the intelligence officer. We handed it over to him and um, washed off the black is beautiful and peaceful night. So we didn't know how Zach and them was, was going. So we were just starting to relax and the ops officer of the D2 stormed into our bungalow and they said, yeah, Zach and them are having a problem. We have to go and assist them. So we scrambled and we started dressing ourselves again in our fighting gear. And um, uh, I'm going to leave the, the, the rest of the story for Zach to tell his operation. But um, that was the end of it. So it was a, 
the plan worked, the operation was successful, we were back within four hours, job done, um, and we were really um, applauded by, by CSI, you know, having the job done. And then I must tell a small piece of the story to my own detriment. I had a Tokarev pistol with me. And this Tokarev pistol, I didn't tie it up onto my kit. It was just tucked into one of my pouches. Now, on our way out, we went through this thick marshy area with reeds and, and that. When we got onto the, uh, the boat, went over, and when I unpacked my kit back at base, my pistol was missing. So, I must have dropped it in the marsh, or it was, I lost it in the marsh. So the next day, Colonel Ulsig of CSI, you know, he asked us and debrief on the operation and so on, and I said, Colonel, I have to testify, I lost a Tokarev pistol. So he said to me, Lieutenant, you from this professional wrecking group, how dare you? You and you know he climbed into me, and I was guilty. Me a culpa. I lost the pistol. But luckily, it wasn't one of our weapons. Couldn't compromise us or anything like that. And he said, "Well, Lieutenant, you will have to go back and go look for your weapon." Now imagine that. I said to him, "Colonel, I think it's a crazy idea. I'll rather pay for this, but um, lessons learned." So he looked at me and he dived into a drawer, opened the drawer and he took out a, a lanyard. So he said, Lieutenant, take this lanyard as a lesson learned, so always tie your pistol to a lanyard. So uh, to my own detriment, I'm telling that, but it was a lesson well learned. But a successful operation, and I want to applaud the team I had with me. Without them and a Tabu and Pete, you know, they're great rugby players and great man catchers. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Zach Garrett. Um, at that uh, stage in 1980, when we were asked to go and do a snatch and grab operations in, in southern Angola, um, it came to sort of our awareness that there was a lot of, a lot of new movement in the area to the east um, of the country uh, and they needed intelligence on what was happening on those areas and unfortunately I had uh, been given the task of snatching and grabbing in uh, a town called Jericho. Jericho, uh, about, I can't remember now, about 60 kilometers from uh, Rundu towards the Caprivi. Um, it was a small town with a, it's elevated quite a bit above the two rivers that come past. And uh, you've got the Kavonga, which is the main, main river coming through. And uh, with that, there's a huge airstrip as well. And uh, it had been a task previously done by me. I think they've got my name etched somewhere there in Jericho. They don't know my name. Uh, Zach was a household name there, I think. And uh, we had done a recce trying to establish who was there, not there. Uh, there was a time when there were uh, aircraft on the runway. Uh, they were there for a few weeks and uh, we were asked to please go in and have a look and maybe do some damage. And apart from that, this was the third excursion into my little town, Jericho. So there was a team of five of us and uh, we went in on the back of a, I think it was Quefu, uh, the big Magiris, with our boat. Uh, with a, a land-based uh, person who was going to be in charge of signal and radio and take us across uh, because we had to have the whole boat on the back of the, the truck and had to find an area as close as we could possibly be to the banks and where there was no population of the local corvus in the area. So it was, to be clear this time, one had to really you know, work it out and we, we came up with a, a decent plan on on where to launch, where to stop, because I mean, the vehicle could only stop for very briefly. 
Well, we offloaded the boat, carried it down the bank, brought in the water, he would then leave and uh, come back later to fetch us when we finished the op. So we managed to plan everything properly and we got off, we got, we embarked, we went across the river, uh, which at that specific point, uh, it's got a lovely, lovely hole, about 20 bunch of hippos congregating in that area. So straight away you're nervous because it's night. Uh, you can hear these hippos, you can't see the hippos. And uh, we also know that there might be a man, there might be in the water. And we have to land somewhere near a hippo hole through the reeds and then go through the reeds. So anyway, long story short, we got through, we managed to land properly. There's a, there's a huge marsh of about 200 meters and then a very steep climb, uh, a good 300 meter climb from the river level up to where Jericho is situated on a, uh, like a point between the two rivers, but a high elevation. So we managed to get our way up to the top of the hill and uh, we knew the layout quite well of the town and it had uh, one main street going all the way down uh, south to north up towards the runway and then it had one running east-west which was a double one. So we decided, I think very similar tactics, we needed to go in and just try and establish if there were people there and where they are, try and find where there is noise so we can try at the same type of tactic of when someone comes out of a building, grab them and run them like up. So what happened was we, we, we inched our way up and the, the, the main road running uh, from east to west has got a pavement about a foot high and it is studded with trees, old fashioned uh, uh, Portuguese style lovely town and uh, the five of us managed to get up there and uh, we did a little bit of low crawling along the road behind the pavement and we sat and watched and oh, it must have been about 20 minutes later there was nothing we, we could see so we moved forward uh, to be in line with the north south, the big road going north south through town so we could see if there's any movement on that side and uh, lo and behold it was about five minutes we'd been sitting there and couldn't see any movement at all in town couldn't hear a word couldn't see anything at all and there was one house about 50 meters and directly in front of us across the road and uh, all of a sudden all hell broke loose and someone had seen us and uh, not realized who we were, what we were, and just taken offense to us being there. And uh, they let rip from inside the house. And uh, so we didn't have much area to, to, uh, to hide behind except for this pavement. And uh, there's just traces flying everywhere, but they knew our exact position. So luckily we also knew theirs, so we returned the fire. And uh, we had this battle in inside. We could see where the rifles were shooting inside the door of the house at us. And uh, the next thing is uh, we, we were going to sort of line up and attack from, from the south. And one of the traces uh, went straight into when a Portuguese uh, demolition expert with us, Manuel Gasper, uh, and so he got shot in the arm. So as soon as that happened, we realized that uh, we had to get out of there fast. And uh, luckily it was only about 10 meters from where we were on the road. So we kept on, uh, two of us stayed behind and kept the guys down in the house while the other three ran across the road. They then gave support fire uh, into the house while we ducked across the road, myself and Manuel. And he was pretty shook up, but uh, he was okay to run. And uh, they came after us uh, as fast as we could run down that hill back towards the river. Uh, these guys just kept shooting at us nonstop. They couldn't see us, they didn't know who we were. So, yeah, not a successful operation, but uh, a hairy one at that. Um, it could have gone either way, but, uh, you know, at that stage it was one of those things where it hadn't been attempted before, and we just had, you know, we couldn't approach from any other area that was well protected and well guarded on both sides of town. So it was only from the south that we could actually attempt to move into that area. So we were pretty restricted on what we could and couldn't do. And uh, yeah, so we managed to get all the way back down. 
they didn't stop shooting. Uh, it, luckily they didn't have mortars or anything else to try and bomb the area we were running into. So we moved out from their line of fire and uh, we went a little bit uh, uh, west and then we managed to get hold of signal the boat and we sat down, managed to get the old manual bandaged up as best we could and a little bit of tourniquet and then, uh, yeah, the boat came up. Uh, a little Zodiac in those days, electric engine. So he came up and uh, picked us up, went back across the river and then someone from Rundu came down, I think it might have been Fritz, uh, because Mano had to be carried back to Rundu and uh, he had a story as well about when he got there that he had to actually cut him out of the, because we don't wear normal uniform, uh, poor old Mano, he had, had to be cut out of his uniform and put browns on before we could go into the hospital because I was the no, you know, as much a normal person from a normal place. But yeah, we tried. Frankie was lucky. We weren't lucky. We were lucky to get out of there. Uh, but yeah, lesson learned and uh, that was quite an experience. But it was great for all of us. You know, the, the, this operation, as Zach explained, and I think he's quite right. You, you know, the, the luck of the evening is either with you or it's not. And it can, can turn out sour or it can turn out sweet. So I think, I think we had a sweet sour evening in terms of, of, of the Reiki group that night. Luckily, nobody killed, stayed behind. Um, Kaspar was uh, stitched up and, 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 and everything happy. And um, was, I think the most important thing is that, um, you know, if an operation like that happens, the, the person is uh, interrogated but he's handled according to the conventional, um, to the Geneva Convention. So he's treated as a, a prisoner of war. He is treated according to the rules and regulations. And um, to the best of my knowledge, I think they were kept to, for, to, to exchange at later stages, you know, and, and um, they are once past this facility they have and the people are actually living in a nice area so they're not kept in a jail or you know they're not mistreated and, and ill-treated so um, it's, 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 it's a positive operation I can maybe also say that that was my last operation I executed in 32 Battalion whilst in the, the Reiki group. Shortly thereafter, I um, went for Special Forces selection. But, but yes, that was my last operation I did in, in 32 Battalion as part of the Reiki group. The Reiki group guys, brilliant guys, they went on to go from strength to strength um, with Willem Maratta as their commander. But the, the, the team at which has spoken now formed the basis of, of the Reiki group and they had very good experience. Thank you, Chris. Franz, what's the difference between a Reiki group and Reiki Wing? Why, why do you use that specific word? Chris, yes, Reiki group, Reiki Wing, I think it's pretty much the same thing. It's, it's a, a, a verbal thing. Some, so I, I think in the beginning, we, we spoke about the Reiki group because it was a group on its own. It was um, recruited as a, as a specific group. And I think as time went by, it was obviously part of 32 Battalion. And, and I think some people started referring to it as, although they were still the group, as a wing of. 32 Battalion and referred to uh, the Reiki Wing. Maybe some of the guys that stayed there longer than I did can, can maybe Zach, uh, one of the other guys, comment on that, but I think that is the, the, the just of the story. Um, Chris, I definitely have a small rectification for what Fonto said here. Yeah. Uh, um, Comrade Nell at the time designated it the Reiki Wing. But with time, 
we refer to ourselves as the group as far as I have explained for the very reasons that he's articulated. So the official designation was in C2 was the C2 Battalion Recce Wing. But as common usage, we simply refer to ourselves as the Recce Group. We didn't even add C2 onto it, we just the C2 Recce Group. You know. So that's how that evolved. It started off officially with one name and evolved into more common usage of all C2. Wat is het in Afrikaans? Vleel. Rekkie vleel. Vleel. Ja. vleel. vleel. Ja. In groep. Vleel. Verkeringsvleel. Ja. Maar dan kan het gepakt in die rekkie groep. Groep, ja. Dat is nou interessant. Ja, we, we, ja, we, 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 we talk about ja. ourselves as a rekkie group. We don't even yeah. mention the word wing ever. We don't even rekkie vleel. Het was always a groep. Ja. 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 Het was a group or a group. Ja, ja. En van ja. all of us, I think it just became a, a group of groups. Ja, ik ja. bedoel, ja. from the moment we started up, we referred to self directly. So, so as what do you want me to be? En van all of us, we referred to self directly. Rekkie groep, ja. Groep, not wing, ever. No, no not wing, group. <coughs> Oké. Okay. Ja, you agree, Peter? Ja, Frank, de koepel neemt. Ja, hoe is het? Wat is het? Rekkie groep. Rekkie groep, ja. Een Ricky Wing is dat je dat je dat in de military. We never flew, so don't yeah. be a wing. Oké, zo is het de story. Do so you want to say something still? I don't know whether to add something or not. Ja, maar dat. Dat is dan weer je no. Yeah. Just going back to Jericho, uh, not part of this operation, but I had to add on. Why I said that they had my number there. Is that it was with Willem Rutter? Um, under his great leadership, that a few of us actually went into Jericho um, and blew the bridge. So I got my own back uh, somewhere down the line, and uh, they lost all their route to the east. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a good payback. So yeah, I won some, lose some. Nice. <laughs> um, the bridge uh, demolition that uh, Zach refers to was a, a resounding strategic success. It effectively cut off the MPLA garrisons to the east of Angola, which has always been traditionally unique territory. But it made it very, very difficult for you to need to operate effectively, right, for the MPLA to operate effectively there. So they increasingly had to rely on air transport. They couldn't bring anything in by vehicle because we'd blown the bridge. So everything had to come in by air. So you can't transport as many people by air as you can by road and so on and so forth. So logistics became a real nightmare for them to maintain a garrison on the eastern side of that river. So it was an exceptional point perhaps that that can be really satisfied that he got his revenge at the end, at, 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 at the end of the day. Of course, I just want to maybe touch on something. You know, I don't think that the enemy ever knew that this snatch operations was executed by 32 battalion. But the psychological effect on the enemy, I mean they report these things to their, these incidences to their higher HQs, etc. And it runs up the, the lines. So I, I think, you know, if somebody comes into your mists, and captures somebody and, you know, take them away, it's got a huge psychological effect on um, the, the, the adversaries or the, if it would happen to us, to us. So, I think, although 32 Battalion eventually had the, the, the brand name Osterwes, the terrible ones, I think Things like this and, and, and the demolition operations which uh, Zach referred to, um, you know, it, it confuses the enemy and, and it makes them alert, I presume, but I think it, they sleep badly. You know, at night you don't know if, if you're going to wait tomorrow or if you go out for a, a twiddle that you are going to come back. So I think that psychological effect is, is, is huge and it is, is in the normal run of time um, not recognized so much. But it does have a huge psychological effect on, and, and I'm sure they've developed uh, means and more 
being more vigilant, etc. But um, it most certainly had a psychological effect on, on the enemy or the adversaries, the, the opponents.